five, four, three, two, one. Well, hello, Ned. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm good. Dude, I, I know, like, we've been friends a long time, but this is, like, the most epic thing ever to have you on my <laughs> spare bedroom <laughs> podcast. Well, it's cool to be on, man. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to it. I'm super stoked, man. I actually, you know what? I forgot. I was actually going to pull up. Uh, I got Greg. I kind of cheated. I got Greg to actually send me some uh, some questions because I wanted to uh, ask you about like the revival you went to in As- at Asbury, yeah, and some of the other things. So I'm going to pull those up too. And uh, questions with Greg. Greg is great. Y'all, y'all, man, are like. You're firing all cylinders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Greg is great. He's good at wording things. He's amazing. He's yeah. like a really good host. He is. He, he is. did it for us in South Africa on the uh, live oh, really? sessions there. Yeah. I'm like, dang, you're a pro. I homie. saw pictures of it. So, tell, actually, you know what? Tell me about how did that go over there in Africa? It was cool. Really, yeah. really good. So, uh, yeah, I think it's about a 16-hour flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg. Of course, we left out of here. Um, got there. Spent a little time relaxing on the property there, just mm-hmm. hanging out, uh, participating what they had going on locally, you know, prayer, worship. Um, did some live broadcasts there. They do a daily thing called Wisdom Sessions. It's basically just leadership type yeah. stuff, ministry type stuff. So it was fun. Then we had the evening uh, crusade meetings. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we had four nights of that. I preached three of the four nights. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was different in that it was out of my normal element in the sense, you know, large evangelistic meetings, there is a, obviously a language gap. Mm -hmm. And then also it was a lot of younger people. And so it's very different than if you're preaching at a conference or at your local church or as a guest speaker somewhere else, it's just pure evangelism. And so I think I probably didn't preach personally more than maybe like 15 minutes even translated. Oh, wow. And it was just hard to the point gospel. Mm-hmm. That's it. What yeah. did Jesus come and do for you? What are the internal implications of that? What does he offer you because of his his life, his death, uh, his, his resurrection, his ascension, and then, of course, his return? Mm-hmm. And basically just did that and then made room for the Holy Spirit to move. And so we had... I think in total, according to their numbers, and they, they keep track of this, but we had about 800 plus salvations. Wow. Recorded in those four yeah. days. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, as a it, the place we were we were holding it, I think we probably had about a thousand to fifteen hundred people there. Now this is just off the top of my head, mm-hmm. um, but had a lot of notable healings. Um, doing deliverance, casting out devils, et cetera. Kind of what you would think in a mission style event. Sure. But uh, really, really cool. I mean, eyes opening up, um, people who had, you know, serious pains in their bodies, back issues. You know, it's like, you know, you have a word of knowledge, you know, some who has back pain right now. Come on up. What's some stuff that you can do? What, what can you do right now? What can't you do? Right. You know, people can't barely bend over and then, they're touching their toes if you pray for them a little bit. So God, we just gave space for the Holy Spirit to move, and you know that's that's one of the greatest apologetics is just the power of God, right? And so, especially in a place like Africa where they're so attuned to the supernatural already, um, sometimes both you know from God and uh, demonic witchcraft, etc. So it was just it was an awesome time, man. Really good memories. That's awesome. I haven't been to Africa ever. Uh, I was telling Greg uh, I, I've always wanted to go, yeah. but I've never actually got to. Uh, but what from what Greg told me, it's like it's a it's a totally different experience when you go to Africa. It, is. it is like when you go to like Japan because I think you've been to Japan, right? I uh, just laid over at the airport in Tokyo. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. which really wasn't that impressive to be right. honest with you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the Narita Airport, which yeah. is Tokyo's main airport, it, it really disappointed me. I was going to lay over <laughs> to Seoul, Korea. I was missing there for like two weeks, and yeah, you know, it, you, when you think about. Japan, and I suppose mm-hmm. this is their premier airport. Yeah, it was not very nice. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, everything was clean. It wasn't like garbage. It was just old. Right. And right. So I'm thinking, man, I'm two hours late over in Japan. I've always wanted to go here. <laughs> All right. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna get I'm gonna get noodles and I'm gonna get sushi. And of course. So it's like a bucket list thing. You get sushi in Japan. Right. 
but it was a so I checked that I checked that box off my bucket list. Mm-hmm. But it has a massive asterisk on it. Is that <laughs> yeah. airport sushi? It was nothing. It was like Publix on a bad day. <laughs> no insult to Publix. They usually have pretty good sushi, you know, for a grocery store. Yeah. But I was not impressed. <laughs> so I got to go back just as a tourist sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to try sushi at like one of those street market like little places in the middle of nowhere or whatever on yeah. the street. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on a something corner like somewhere. that. Something yeah. like that. Just something you know, it's, it's better higher quality once right. you get the airport. Yeah. Because I'm sure like the sushi in Korea is on the corner is like the equivalent to like a hot dog on the corner in New York. You know? you know, it's not quite that way. Sushi's still in Korea, and you got to get <laughs> Japanese sushi because Korean sushi they actually have their own sushi. It's very different, mm-hmm. and it's not good in my opinion. Like their their local style is just yeah. You know, it's it's kind of like sushi to me in Asia's equipment, like you know, a burrito here in America. It's like yeah. we have a tortilla. <laughs> And you put stuff in it. Yeah. And if you wrap it and fold it, this is a burrito. <laughs> yeah. Does it matter if it's, it's French fries and fish or right. if it's carne asada, yeah. beans and rice, you know, right. it's, you know, it's like pizza. Like if yeah. you think pineapple is, <laughs> you can put pineapple novels on your pizza. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can do that, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so theirs is just, it's just different. Uh, but they do have Japanese, obviously Japanese style sushi restaurants there. And it was excellent that's really awesome. really premier i love i love just going to like i like to ask locals like what's the best food around and yeah. just going to those places like when i was in mexico uh the place we were staying at had like this little taco shop like sure. right down the road and the every every local was like that's the place like yeah. go there and right next to it there's an ice cream shop there's mm-hmm. homemade ice cream so go there after that and so of course me and ellie were we're foodies so we're like let's go hit that like right now yeah. so we went to the taco shop and we ordered like Three tacos a piece, and oh my gosh, man, it was like the best tacos I've ever eaten in my whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't beat that <laughs> local awesome. stuff. No, it's 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 amazing. The um, <laughs> it's so funny about getting good street food. Yeah. So my uh, my brother in law Taylor, and he's in, of course Greg was with me on this trip too, mm-hmm. and so they, you know, they're like ramen nuts. They're, yeah. they're ramen oh, yeah. aficionados. I'm not. I like it, but I'm not into it like they are. I didn't come from the anime generation, okay? It wasn't, right. it wasn't a big deal to me. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z was something kids watched when I was... When I was right. I'm 39 years old, so I just kind of missed out on right. that. But uh, at, <laughs> any, anyhow, <laughs> uh, so they really wanted like street-style ramen. The guy that was with us hosting us, Ricky, he's he grew up in Guam, so he's he's actually American, and mm-hmm. so he's he's Korean and has lived there and uh, as an American citizen and very much in the culture. And he kept saying, "There's there's better places to go." He's like, "You might as well just go to the gas station and get ramen, the convenience store and get and get ramen, uh, mm-hmm. than one of these street vending places." And you know, they they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen, and he wouldn't elaborate. They're like, "Why? Why?" And so one night we go. He's like, yeah, just go. This is the best one in, in town. Go for it. Mm. So we get there, and the guy, he starts to chop up some green onions. like, And then he throws it in the pot. It's boiling up. And all of a sudden, he breaks out a pack of ramen like you pick up at Walmart. Yeah. And he just puts it in there. And then he grabs a flavor packet out, presents it, shakes it in front of him, a little show, <laughs> opens it up, and gets it in there. And it was like, this is just... <laughs> This is just regular stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is not actually not a, a, a big deal <laughs> at all. And they, so they got bamboozled. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's like, it's not special at all. <laughs> no, it's not. Even they were like, I think they actually sell this brand of ramen in America that they're serving us here. So it's not even an exotic <laughs> instant noodle. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so stinking funny. But yeah, yeah. No, it's like I'm disappointed so hard right now. <laughs> I know. But, but the most, in, this is turning into a food podcast. Sorry yeah, for the yeah. Asbury revival. But, <laughs> but no, the coolest thing I've ever experienced from a food standpoint is I, I yeah. love food. I mean, take. Oh, know, yeah. Half We're preachers. At, we love you food. Can, you can look at me until I like food. A little too much, maybe. <laughs> so. Um, I was over there on a trip with my leaders, and uh, we were meeting with a certain business person that was a friend in the ministry over there, and he wanted to take us out uh, to a really nice meal. And so he took us to the King's Buffet at the Grand Hyatt Seoul. Mm. And this is like fine dining, but a buffet. And it was unreal. Everything was top-notch. They had 
They had like an Italian section, a French section, an American section. Wow. They had a Japanese section, a full sushi bite. I mean, like top-notch rolls. They had Middle Eastern, Turkish. They had uh, North African. They had Chinese. And like this pastry section that was unbelievable. Like if you've ever been on a cruise and you have all those nice buffets, it was like oh, this, yeah. but it was like five-star. It was unbelievable. Real. That's probably one of the best meals I've ever had in my life because you know, king crab and then you got your favorite sushi rolls and you have filet mignon and then you have – I was just spoiled. I was like, oh, my Lord. Like, I'm so worthy. Jesus. Jeez. I've actually never been on a so cruise. So worthy, Jesus. I've never been on a cruise, but I've heard that's how the food is. Oh, yeah. I like remember that. you tried, but then COVID kept messing it up. <laughs> yes. Oh, tears of sadness. <laughs> I mean – I tried so hard. We bought our tickets like six months in advance. I mean, we were going to have just a, an incredible time over there. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we were just so looking forward to it. It was going to be our first outing, like, as a married couple. Okay. And then just, bam, just not happening. Right. And then uh, we ended up, uh, I think we just ended up traveling to, like, Tennessee for a few days. And that, that's what we ended up having to do is we had no, no other options. Yeah, it's nothing wrong yeah. with that, though. But, yeah, uh, I've heard the food on those places are just amazing. It's, yeah, it's pretty amazing. good. Amazing. It's pretty good. Well, yeah, so, uh, well, um, I, I really wanted to, to bring you in because uh, shifting away from food, even though I could talk about food for two hours. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I really wanted to bring you in because you got to go to the Asbury Revival. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, obviously it was like a phenomenon here in the States. Uh-huh. And, I mean, I, I don't know if, if other – you know, countries and stuff heard about it as much as, I mean, it was a big deal here. I know. I, yeah. I remember hearing that there were people from several countries that came. Like even there was a, a pastor uh, and his wife from Chile mm. who sold their car to come. Oh, wow. To pay for tickets to come. Cause it just felt the Holy spirit told them to go. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's incredible. Well, um, one of the things that, uh, me and Greg, cause I was asking Greg for like, uh, some prompts as far as like questions regarding the Asbury revival. Cause he actually had some, I guess in more like inside knowledge than I, I did about it. I only knew of it. I, I mm-hmm. didn't get to go or anything like that, but, um, but I would say like, um, I wanted to know specifically, how did it feel when you walked in, uh, you got to go inside the building, right? So I did not get to go inside Hughes chapel. Okay. It was just too packed out. Right. Uh, by the time I got there, they had really prioritized Gen Z. So if you're like 25 and under. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we had one of the youth from our church who came with us. Right. My wife and I and my three oldest kids came. And so there was a line there for these you know, 25 to high school age kids mm-hmm. and a chaperone. And so I went with him in that line as a chaperone. Uh, and then by the time we waited it out... They said they weren't taking anyone else in Hughes Chapel. So I went across the street to Estes Chapel. So Asbury University, you have the college there and you have the seminary. Now, formerly they separated as organizations years and years and years ago. But they're right there in the same property. Mm. And so literally directly across the street, you have a smaller chapel, Estes Chapel. Uh, but the same type of move, I mean, the same type of move was happening there. I mean... Frankly, there was God was moving just there on the lawn. Wow! Uh, you had groups just in spontaneous worship, prayer going on. You had preaching going on. It was a beautiful sight, and it was people from from all over. And and, and the unique thing is, Asbury is a Wesleyan associated university, so not not United Methodist, but the Wesleyan. It, you know, everything that came out of Charles Wesley, you had some groups of the, the Wesleyan, you have the United Methodist, the Southern Methodists. There's a few other branches, the Nazarenes, I believe, are somewhere in that mix as well. And so being that it wasn't a, it wasn't a mainline uh, Pentecostal university, like a Lee University right. or um, like an evangel with the, uh, in, in Missouri with the Assemblies of God. Um, it and it certainly wasn't a charism under some sort of charismatic branch. Although there are charismatic Wesleyans and Methodists, uh, and they're, they're actually the Pentecostals and Wesleyans can be very similar in, in some groups and, and, and streams of that. Uh, but because it wasn't one of those groups, it actually attracted a lot of people that you wouldn't necessarily associate with revival movements. Sure, sure. Um, in the way that maybe we as as Pentecostals or Charismatics might think about it. 
So for instance, I was there in line and I was talking to a young lady who worked for Mo the Moody uh, Bible Institute, their publishing house actually. Moody's not really charismatic or Pentecostal, known for that at all. Um, but she was there hungry for the presence of God. You had folks who just all, oh, it just transcended so many denominational lines. And so that was pretty, pretty amazing. So even out there, just people talking about the Lord, what's he doing? It stirred things up. We had a, uh, the, the young man that was with me, Micah, I think you've met Micah before. He's a drummer in our church, has an incredible testimony. God brought him out of gang life like a year ago. He had a power encounter with the Holy Spirit, just actually in his room. Mm -hmm. And then through some happenings, filtered into our church. And I you know, have, have had the opportunity to pastor, mentor, and disciple him for about a year now. But he's really big into evangelism mm -hmm. and really big into just street ministry, healing, et cetera. So this girl walks by with a boot on her foot uh, from some sort of injury. We're there in line. He says, I, I need to go. I need to go pray for her. I just feel like I'm supposed to. I was like, go for it, bro. She ends up getting healed right there. Now, I, I didn't I didn't notice. I, you know, I thought that's amazing at school. That's typical, Micah. That's, that's just how we teach our people to be, you know. Um but it, it got picked up by someone, a guy named Brent Williamson, who was there at the Revival a lot. He's a, a minister, I think, out of Ohio. And his daughter, um, I think it's Hannah Williamson, has like a fairly significant Christian uh, YouTube channel and social media presence. Well, he got a picture of this going on, heard the testimony of the girl about how she got healed. Her daughter, his daughter, ends up sharing it. Jim Garlow, who's to some people is a pretty well-known minister. He's nationally, internationally known, greatly published artist, greatly published um, uh, author. Uh, he picks it up. So it, even moments like that, that went kind of semi-viral, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had thousands of impressions on Facebook and, and Instagram, as far as I know. And so what I'm saying is, is is and I'm just I'm not trying to puff up my guy, but what I'm saying is that's the kind of things that were happening just out and about. Sure. Just in the atmosphere of hunger. Yeah. And so finally once they announced that they weren't taking anyone else in to the huge to Hughes Chapel, we said, let's just go over to Estes. And so we get we got in there very quickly, walked in the door. It's still pretty pretty packed out. Um and man, just the the raw hunger for the presence of God and just the adoration of his person, it was it was gravitational is how I describe it. You, you there's places I've been to where it's harder to not pray and worship than it is to pray and worship. So I say it's like gravitational, like it just it just pulls on mm. everything in you, you have this great desire to be closer to God. And it's not that we shouldn't have that or in a measure don't have that in our regular Christian lives. I'm someone who pursues that. But it was it was like if I was swimming in a calm river in one direction, you, know, you have the grace of God that's like a current that, that helps you along. You can't do anything with grace, but you also have your choosing. And so I'm, I'm paddling with it. And then suddenly you come to a place in the river where it just begins to rush the current at a greater speed and you're just swept up in it. Mm. And so it's a very, this is, this place was a very old style, old school chapel. They even had, I don't know if, if any churches you've been involved in had the actual like literal altars mm -hmm. where you had like the padding for your knees, oh, yeah. old school, you get there just, it reminded me of these old Pentecostal churches I grew up in. Yeah. And so my mind just going back to these encounters I had with the Lord as a kid. And I noticed people were going up to the altar. They had altar workers there. Just, I mean, there was nothing theatrical about it at all. It was all very low key. There was nothing really demonstrative about it at all. It was very just, just chill. And so altar workers were sitting down in chairs on the other side of the altar. I didn't know what they had made an altar call for at all. I was like, if they were made an altar call for left-handed pregnant women, I'm going up there. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I just went and I just began to weep mm. and weep and weep. And what was, what was taking place in my heart was at least, um, I mean, just, 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 just what was going on in my heart was, 
is as I began to weep and just well up, you know, I love um, St. Simeon, the new theologian, who was an Orthodox theologian around uh, the year 1000. He talks about the importance of weeping and tears and how it's an overflow from what's happening in the soul. It's just so cleansing. Mm. And in that moment, I was experiencing that, that, that weeping that was like washing over my soul as the Spirit of God was leading me into it. And, you know, for me, I've been pastoring for probably about oh, maybe six, seven years now. You know, pastoring is not the easiest thing in the world sometimes. I describe it as like a full contact emotional sport in some ways. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it's just, there's, there's stuff that goes on. It's not, it's, 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 it's not easy. Some things are hard. It's not that things are terrible. God does great things. And I'm grateful to do it. But I didn't personally realize how much I felt like unreleased emotional trauma and stress I had on the mm. inside of me. And that's what came out of me in the way of like, Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy, Jesus. This is this is for you. What I'm doing here is, is solely for you. So it, for me, it's kind of a, a solid reorienting that no matter what I'm going through or have to deal with in in serving the Lord and, and thereby serving his sheep, serving his flock, feeding the flock, no matter what kind of kickback I get or attack or or, or whatever, um, it doesn't matter because it's all ultimately in service to Christ. And mm-hmm. so therefore, whatever I endure is worth going, is, is, is worth going through. So for me, it just re, it, it reoriented me into a place of service to Christ in a more, in a more defined and I think correctly aligned way, a really just shedding of self in that sense. It's a, a beautiful, it's hard to say cause it's, it's, it's a, it's a, how do I explain this? But it was like a beautiful crucifixion of flesh mm. in a moment. It was it was odd. Maybe you've been through this before, but you know, um, I think I went through a season of about eighteen months of pretty pretty challenging depression. To be honest with you, and it was weird. And some and I had never been through that in my life. I was a very positive, upbeat, optimistic person. But it's it, there's there's moments when you're in the midst of that if you're pursuing Christ in the middle of it, you know, where in your deepest brokenness you also feel closest to God, mm-hmm. and it's very odd. And it was kind of like that in a moment. Not that I was in some depressed state or something like that. Praise God, He's He's brought me out of all that. But where I was feeling such intense brokenness, but the most also such intense closeness to the Lord. So I just marinated in that moment when the altar workers came by and he was praying for me and didn't really ask a whole lot of questions. He just prayed and prayed. And, um, you know, it's funny, coming from a prophetic background, uh, the guy was just spotting, he was like, you're a pastor, aren't you? I didn't have my pastor look on or whatever. Just very low key. I was traveling. We drove two and a half hours to get there from a hotel in Bowling Green. Mm. Um, Wilmore, Kentucky, there's nothing convenient about it. It's 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 just this little community. And so um, I'm there in just like my favorite Jesus sweater, joggers and tennis shoes. I think I had, had an Alabama hat on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he's like, you're a pastor, aren't you? I was like, yes, yes, sir, I am. And speaking of prophesy some things over me and was just so like spot on. I was like, wow, God, this is... This is amazing. This is incredible. And so I went back and found a, a large space in the in the room and just laid on my face and I started weeping all over again. I just, I love to cry. You know, some folks they, they like to catch the joy of the Holy Ghost. I mean, I've had that happen to me where it's just like, you know, holy laughter, which is extremely uncomfortable for me, to be honest with you. There's something seemingly so unpious about laughing. Mm-hmm. I know that's nonsense. But that's just kind of like how I, if you ever catch me laughing in a service, it's the most real thing ever. It's the most uncomfortable deal. <laughs> <laughs> you like holy laughter, you know? Yeah. Just, oh man. But but I just, I just wept and wept. I really just fixated on the worthiness of Christ, on the sufficiency of his suffering, and just being grateful that he would allow me to serve him and his people in any capacity. Because at the end of the day, we're all we're all unworthy in our own merits. 
And it's just the favor of God that he allows us to do anything for him. Um, so that was my experience. Mm. Uh, you know, left, came back, and uh, just, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, is was this revival? Was it an outpour? Was it this? Was it that? And I've listened to some of the critics and some of the, the thinkers on it, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating conversation we can get into if you want to. But I was revived in that moment. Yeah. And so it blessed me a lot, and it blessed me. What blessed me probably even more than what happened for me personally, not probably, but definitely, is to see God hit a new generation with a fresh hunger for him. Sure. So seeing those young people on fire for him, loving him, um, that was just amazing to me. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. Are there any takeaways from the atmosphere that may influence your viewpoints on revival? Um, not really, I'd say. Um, and that is not to diminish or say I'm some sort of expert in revival, but I've purposed to study revival. Mm. Cause I, 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 I love revival. I have a desire to see revival in my own life, in my own church, to be a part of revival, to be used in revival. And so just my natural curiosity and hunger you know, it really made me a student of it. And sure. so for me, I guess I'd say my biggest takeaway that I really appreciated about it was understanding the simplicity in a sense of revival. You know, one of the one of the critiques I've heard is well you can you can have this anywhere, which I'd say my response to that would be yes and no. Mm. Um, you can't have that revival in your own bedroom like they had there. Right, because you can't fit that many people for starters. Sure, <laughs> you yeah. can. Have, I've had some amazing, incredible, personal experiences with the Spirit of God in in my quote unquote prayer closet, very much alone. And those are good and they're worthwhile. I think it's foolish when we try to start comparing these to one another. We should just mm-hmm. be grateful in it all, especially when we're dealing with something like revival. That's an extra biblical term. There's no clear-cut definition of it in Scripture. Um, it's it's, but but that being that being said, my takeaway was hunger and space are really two of the essential ingredients of revival. Mm-hmm. Or I'd say to experience an outpouring like that, if if someone doesn't want to use the term revival, I I, I just realized very very quickly. There, I mean, the facilities of what someone might say, like, you know, creating, setting an atmosphere or even like the way a, a church looks or the sights, the sounds. Um, it was very simple worship, but it was just a lot of hunger. The one, I, well, let me say this. Now, the one thing I did take away. Okay, let me, let me go back. The thing I took away that was unique that I hadn't really seen demonstrated in a Protestant context was the... The emphasis on confession of sin. Mm. So I've heard about confession as it's practiced in the Catholic, um, from the Catholic point of view. Um, I've, I've heard about it from the Orthodox point of view. i would never experienced it in a Protestant dimension. And so that was a central theme in this outpouring this revival I'll call it I feel good calling it revival um, and this revival and the they point out you know the scriptures teaches us that uh, confess your sins to one another and be healed mm-hmm. and so part of what was going on at the altars that I didn't realize until later was a lot of the altar calls were centered around if there's something that you need to confess mm-hmm. to a brother or sister in the Lord um will make space at this altar. Wow. And the people there were so gentle and so kind. Um, and so they made a safe space for folks to go over there and say, hey, I've been struggling with this sin or I've been struggling with guilt from such and such I committed in the past. And people are experiencing such freedom to have a, we know scripturally that God, the Lord forgives us when we repent, when we, we, we seek him for forgiveness. 
but it was there was something so cleansing and freeing for people when they'd have another brother or sister look at them and and love and and caring and say the blood of Christ forgives you, the church forgives you. Something so freeing about it, which I thought was amazing because it, it was it was a practice of the early church. And the, you know it's funny people talk about they want the Book of Acts first century church experience. That's beautiful. The histor- history teaches us that they, they fasted twice a week and every Thursday they came together and confessed their sins to one another. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not a lot of people would be down for that. Right. But that was their general practice. And so to see how that was implemented in a Protestant uh, evangelical context, I thought was really beautiful. It was very gentle. It was healing. And so... That's made me think of, I, I've never seen that in, in any church I've been a part of, unless it was in a counseling type situation. Mm-hmm. But by then it, it wasn't in terms of soul maintenance, it was more like crisis at that point. Yeah, It wasn't so much, hey, I need to confess this. And it was, I have this crisis in my life, it's because of this issue. So it was like a pre-crisis unloading. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just... I thought that was beautiful. I'd love to see that implemented in, in more churches and spaces and, you know, talking, you know, seeking to talk with my team about how would we implement something like that here? Because I see, I can, I can see how healing that is and yeah. how scriptural it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I hadn't heard that. That's, that's incredible. But you're right. There's not a lot of, I mean, I know it's, it's simple, but there's not a lot of forgiveness, just open, just, Professing and confessing of sin and yeah. and forgiveness yeah. uh, to one another, and it's um, very scriptural. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and and I don't know you. Um, you know a lot of you. You I guess you study politics still some and that kind of thing. Um, some, yeah. But given the current state of like where we're at in America, like mm-hmm. as a country right now, what do you feel like this particular revival has done for this country? as a whole or if anything at all I don't know I think it's definitely done something um, in the sense that it will have an effect my my thoughts are you know I, I, I as we all should I look at the church as a definitely a separate entity from the nation itself you know which mm-hmm. that's just very basic I think some people the, allow those two things to bleed into each other to a very unhealthy point. So I'm first a uh, citizen of Christ's kingdom. I appreciate that he placed me in America. He could have placed me in any other nation in the world. Or even as born in America, he could have sent me off somewhere else. But I'm here and I love my country and I believe that's a godly thing. What I believe it did was it, to me, it, 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 it sent a lot of hope to the church to me, it, it, to me, it has. Because we've seen so much negativity uh, from a lot of the church here in the last handful of years. To me, it showed that God is just very sovereign. Mm-hmm. And so in the midst of where we have a government that probably a lot of the church doesn't favor and doesn't believe at least favors the people of God, the Lord sends a revival that gets the attention of the nation in the midst of that context, which to me is just so like God. Um, my my concern for a lot of the church has, has been, um, while I do believe that we should have a healthy level of engagement in the society, because the Lord did, he, he in, his, in his sovereignty placed us in a space and time where we have a participatory voice mm-hmm. within our governmental system. That's something that that Paul didn't have in his day. Right. Um, even Paul as a Roman citizen, he may have been able to to vote in municipal elections where the candidates were handpicked by Rome. It's where Rome won no matter what. Mm-hmm. And it's like a parent. You want to give your kids choices because you want them to learn to think critically. You want them to feel like they have some sort of uh, degree of self-determination, but you control the choices so no matter what, they have a good choice. You don't just do what they want to do. That's how Rome functioned in terms of their level of democracy, which is very limited. Um, but I believe that in... So, so some of what Paul says about the Christians' interaction with the government, 
is 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 definitely flavored by the context in which he lived. And so we have to extrapolate from the scriptures how do we live godly lives in the midst of a pluralistic democracy mm. uh, where we do have a, a vote. So so with that being said, I believe a lot of Christians they leaned way too much on the power of government as an agent of reform in a solution to our nation's ills, which to me is not unimportant, but as a total strategy is is doomed because mm-hmm. legislation can't change hearts. Right. The gospel does. Yeah. And we, we start to build up these kind of, we build up an us and them mentality that is is shaped by lines that aren't necessarily biblical. So there is an us and them in a sense. There's the church and there's the Gentile world, those outside the people of God. Mm-hmm. But we're to invite them in. We're to, you know, not, just, not just a wholesale free-for-all, there's standards, but everyone's invited. Right. And so for me, I've seen a great weakness in evangelism, a great weakness in prayer, but it's not because people aren't capable. I mean, you, people are radically evangelistic when it comes to their favorite politician or political party. Mm-hmm. There's, again, nothing wrong with supporting a candidate. There's nothing wrong with supporting godly values and standing against ungodly values in place of legislation. I think that's important. We should engage in that. But that's part of the solution. And it's to me, it's actually a minor part of the solution. Because what we saw here is that because a handful of college students decided that they wanted to worship some more, they wanted to engage in prayer a little more, they responded to the Holy Spirit's yes to their hunger. Suddenly the attention of the nation, the world, came upon this little Christian college in the middle of Nowheresville, Kentucky. If God can do it there, he can do it anywhere. Amen. Prophetically, too, um, Asbury's had a handful of revivals over its its time. Mm-hmm. I think like maybe five or six going back to its inception. Mm-hmm. Um I don't, most of them preceded major moves. None of them were very long. That's, yeah. see, that, that's the one thing is I've heard people criticize and say, well, it was real revival, it's still be going on. It's like, what do you mean? Revival is not, revival has a purpose. It's, I've heard people argue, well, we should always live in revival. I don't really, I don't, I, I, I can't say that I really agree with that statement. Because this is the way we should be living in Christ. Mm -hmm. To say one needs to be revived means that there was a deficit that existed in your spiritual life that should not have been. Revival catches us up. If we need to be revived, then it's because we allowed a deficit in. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to, as Paul says in Galatians, that as we're in the Spirit, also stay in step with the Spirit. If we stay in step with the Spirit, there's no need for revival because we're walking in fullness. Right. Of the now doesn't mean we don't grow, doesn't mean we don't mature, but for right now we're where we ought to be. It's 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 just like if my five year old pees his bed, do I like it? No, but it's not a big deal. If my six, if my fourteen year old's pee in their bed, that's kind of a problem, right? Why? Because that's not where they're supposed to be. Five year old, I expect that, you know. Mm-hmm. If if my five year old comes and says, "Daddy, look, I read this page in this book," I'm impressed. Because that's like it's 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 a little ahead. If my fourteen year old son comes and gives me the same book, damn, look, I read this. I'm like, okay, good job. So what? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come back and tell me you finished War and Peace. Yeah, <laughs> then I'll be impressed. But it, that's that's the the issue. So I, I feel like we sometimes can go the other way and make an idol out of revival. Yeah. And and that's a For problem. Sure. So in 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 a in a sense, we should be aware of our need. We should be humble to admit when we have a need. Now, that's the problem with the Pharisees. When John comes on the scene, I mean revivals. You could call that a revival. For sure, twenty thousand people coming to a very inconvenient place to hear a message that's rougher than a night in jail, and their response is, "Well, what do we do?" 
Yeah. And he's like, okay, you know, <laughs> here's how you ought to live <laughs> in light of that. And he's, he's, and they come and receive a baptism of repentance in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God. And so, um, and you have those Pharisees, it's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to sit back and criticize it. They're saying, I don't need it. Mm-hmm. When actually they desperately needed it, mm-hmm. you know. And so for me, just as far as get back to back to what it means for the nation, we'll see. We'll see what it means for the nation. I, I don't know because I'd hate to say. I, I believe it's going to have imp- so it's going to have implications. Like I said, I kind of rabbit trailed here, but but the Asbury revival one happened in like the just before the 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 healing movement mm-hmm. in the forties and fifties. Uh, the one that happened. Uh, most recently, prior to this this present one, was in the 70s, and the Jesus people movement came right after that, on the heels of it. So I just wonder if we're in the same pattern, that we're going to see a greater move come, um, if this really is some sort of portent to that. Um, but I, I don't know. But I will say I'm fascinated to see what happens to the lives of those that were greatly touched by it, what goes on. Because you, 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 one thing you can look at is, is some revivals that have happened that have been great even. The greatest thing that happened from them wasn't what happened in the revival. It was the ministries that were birthed after it mm-hmm. and what those people did after the fact. And you look at the Toronto Blessing and you see someone like Heidi Baker. Heidi Baker's gone on to do incredible things, monumental things in the kingdom of God in, in Africa. That that came. She was a burnt out missionary when she went to to Toronto. Mm-hmm. She got just totally shellacked by the power of God. Was out for like a week or something crazy like that. Wasn't really even functional. Had to be carried around everywhere. She was just gone. And then she goes back to Africa, and I think she gets some weird disease. Like just all hell broke loose for a year after that. But she got through it, and then in one year, planted more churches than she had in all the years before. Her mm-hmm. and her husband, Roland Baker. I mean, just incredible things to go out. So I'm I'm interested to see what occurs in the next five years out of this. Yeah. And um, you know, could have very positive effects on the nation. I I, I I hope so. I hope so. I'm not I'm not a doomsdayer. Um I think there's a lot of work left to do. I think there's a lot of scripture yet to be fulfilled. Um, if Jesus wants to come tomorrow, that's great. But if, if, from what I read in Scripture, we're just to be doing what we're called to do now. Right. We're, we're supposed to act as if he's going to come immediately, but plan as if it's going to be 10,000 years from now. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I just want to be busy about the Father's business. So um, I'm fascinated to see what goes, goes on after it. So, yeah, I hope, I hope it touches the nation in a, in, a ma- in a major way. It's definitely, I believe, left an imprint on it and hopefully made us realize that prayer really works hunger for god really works as i from what i saw there i don't believe that it's just unique to them i believe that any group of hungry christians that will make space to seek the lord can see god extraordinarily pour out his spirit on a region that can actually catch the attention of the globe Mm -hmm. but it's the, the hunger has to be present. Yeah. So I just pray for an increase of hunger. That's great. I mean, I, th- I think you're right. And I hope that it did leave an imprint on the nation. But I mean, I really hope that it, it, it made an imprint on the church. Because um, we've went through several years that I've felt like of, you know, that like this lull of time where um, we weren't necessarily stagnant, you know, in our churches. And sure. I don't mean like, like a certain denomination. I just mean uh, as a church as a whole. <laughs> Um, when I was younger, I remember there was a lot more spontaneous prayer revivals yeah. and revivals and uh, traveling evangelists that would it would just sparks of just things happening, you know, right. uh, you know, miraculous healings and that kind of stuff. And I haven't really seen that as much as I've wanted to it mm-hmm. as I've gotten older, um, you know. So I hope that maybe you know some of that will start maybe coming back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. You know, probably some of my thoughts. I mean, I, I grew up in, in that paradigm, too. Um, mm-hmm. I think the one thing, though, that was probably an unintended consequence of that is 
because a lot of people were waiting on an event for God to move mm-hmm. instead of being intentional and moving with God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I had to realize. Um, I'm 39 years old in my mid twenties. God began to move on me in a pretty extraordinary way. And it started out in prayer. Um, it was this a, a prayer, a young adults prayer group. I started at my home church at CI. It was just centered around praying for revival and repentance. And God just, he just, I mean, poured out on us like crazy. CI, you mean Christian International? Yeah. That's the one in um, Santa Rosa Beach. Santa Rosa Beach, yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so the Lord just began to move on us like crazy. But it wasn't it wasn't this, oh, this wonderful feeling of basking in his love, although his love was very present. It was, it was as we began to pray for him for revival and also a deeper work of repentance in our heart, we, be, we came face to face. <laughs> with a dimension of his holiness that that highlighted the dimension of our um of of kind of our our fleshliness our sinfulness mm-hmm. where we were and it was kind of we, we entered this like woe is me moment like isaiah i mean <laughs> akin to that uh just in our hearts like lord cleanse our hearts is in a very real way and then once he kind of dealt with our personal issues and sin, we really begin to cry out for those that were lost. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I remember in some prayer meetings, you know, us getting up and I believe I got up and said, you know, I felt the Holy Spirit saying, we've had mothers and fathers and pastors and leaders praying for us, interceding for our souls for years that we come in fullness. We have a generation of people there now where their parents and their grandparents have probably hadn't been in church ever maybe outside of an Easter event or baptism or christening. No one who's praying for them. And so we said, Lord, help us. We, we, we want to adopt in the spirit, the unreached and the unsaved and cry out for them as if we were their family. Lord, give us this grace. And man, we would just wail. Mm. I mean, in travail. I mean, I'm, 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 you know, Pentecostal roots, charismatic. I don't really know how to call myself right now, to be honest with you. I just, I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and uh, it's true. And I uh, believe that God moves in power and, and the gifts are for today. Uh, <laughs> that's just a great way to say it. Yeah. Some of the other terms have, have a lot of baggage to them. But I mean, there, so, so I believe in tongues. But I also believe that there is a language in prayer beyond what we define as tongues. Mm. That is, I've heard it preached that, well, groanings and utterances, that's tongues. I actually, I don't think so. Because I've had groanings. I've had, we, I think tears have a language all to their own. I mean, if I could pray for one gift to come on the body of Christ as a whole right now, and the Lord would say, I'll answer it, is the gift of tears. We need tears. We underestimate the value of, of tears. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, well, we don't want emotionalism. Well, you know, God's emotional. A survey of the Old Testament will tell you real quick how emotional God is. Jesus in the New Testament, the very expressed image of the Father, the Word of God made manifest, the Logos in flesh, he wept over Jerusalem. He wept over Lazarus, who he was going to raise from the dead anyways. God's not unemotional. And so when we begin to encounter the person of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have an emotional response. I mean, I can't imagine encountering the person of God in a very real manifest way and not having some sort of response. It's like saying I went through, a, my house went through a Category 5 hurricane and we got no rain. That's nonsense. <laughs> and, and so... When, when, when we begin to move in tears, and then we realize we came to this point where we realized we needed a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, I growing up in a Pentecostal context, which I, I so love and so appreciate everything I gained from that. So I, when I say this, I don't want to sound, sound critical or unappreciative, but the emphasis that was displayed to me, at least that I caught as a young man, was the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so you can speak in tongues. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says so you have power to be a witness. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I've met many people in my life who I witnessed having some sort of encounter who spoke in tongues but had no power to witness. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not here to question what they say they had or didn't. I'm not their judge. But if we don't have a power to be a witness, then there's some sort of disconnect. Or maybe there's just a misuse. Or maybe it's just we need a little adjustment in our theology. And so for me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the power, is, is, is the power to be an effective witness for Christ. The, the Greek word there that Jesus uses in Acts is you'll be my, my martis, which is similar to martyr. And so it's a, a very serious thing. And so for us, we realize we need to be intentional with what we have. So I remember one meeting, we just prayed like, Lord, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, fresh and anew. If we don't have boldness to be a witness, we're lacking in something. Mm -hmm. God, would you please baptize us in your spirit that we would have boldness to go out and be a witness? Because we want to transition from just praying for souls to going out and winning souls. Right. And so the Lord, he granted our request. He answered our prayer. And we got out and started moving. And so what happened was, is when we took what we already had and were intentional, we begin to see healing. We saw a lot outside the church. We saw salvations outside of the church. We saw baptisms of the Holy Spirit outside the church. We saw, we, we saw the casting of the devils outside of the church. I can't tell you how many miracles happened at the Destin Commons. We had a lady, literally, um, my sister, ended up doing deliverance on her. She was, she, she, this, this woman, she came over to my sister. She was leading the, the girls group. We generally, we generally separated by gender at when we went out in evangelism teams. Mm-hmm. And this woman saw her praying for another group and came and like broke up in the group and was like, I, I, I need prayer. I need prayer. And so my sister kind of pulls her off to the side and she starts describing what's going on. She says, ma'am, you, you, you don't need prayer. You need what's what we call deliverance. If, if, if you don't know what that means, you have an unseen enemy that you need to detach from your person. And so she discerned it, cast that, and the woman ended up puking right there in the middle of Destin Commons. <laughs> Sister gave her prophetic word. She calls her back, and then she's Christian, had you know just some, some challenges or whatever. Um, but my sister prophesied to her, gave her like, I don't know, eight or nine specific points. The lady calls her back like 60s later to tell her, my life is totally transformed. And by the way, every single thing that you prophesied over me has been fulfilled. And so for me, when you read the book of Acts, I remember one day when the Lord was, was just a season where he was doing a work in me. I got, I was so hungry to see the miraculous happen. Not in a sense where I wanted God to put on a show, but I was like, what I'm seeing and hearing isn't, isn't, it I'm not seeing it demonstrated in my walk, and I want that because not because I want some special dimension of power to for people to look at me. It's because I want you to be known, and I want to know you in that way as well. And I remember I sat, I had a day in my office where miraculously the phone never rang once, and I got to sit and read through the entire book of Acts in one day, and like it got to a point where in my office. The presence of God just got so thick. It, it, it felt like my person was being squeezed. One person did walk in my office that day. And they shut the door and went right back out. Talked to me like, I don't know what's going on in there, but something something otherworldly is happening in there. <laughs> but I'm sitting there crying and I recognize all this is happening outside of the Almost all of this is happening outside of the meeting. When I realized this, this Holy Spirit enjoys certain things. And if you want a little more of his attention, I think, this isn't really a theological statement. This is just me talking from my experience. Do what he likes to do. And he'll participate. And you'll be participating with him. So I think that's that's kind of the key is is we need a def- we need an awakening to the diffusion of the power of God within the body that goes beyond just the pulpit. I think as we do that as we venture out we'll see 
we'll see more and more and more. And I still see it going on my daily life. I the other day I was I met a lady and um, we got in a conversation, and she started talking about how she never wanted to be married, how bad men were, and all this other stuff. And I started sharing about my marriage, and um, all of a sudden she starts crying. I didn't talk about the Lord once at this point. And she starts crying. She's like, what are you doing to me? She's like, I just, I feel like I have hope, <laughs> but I'm crying. Like what's going on? It's like, you can't just meet random people and, and, and make them cry. And so I started sharing a little more. And she's just like, stop, I'm crying. Like I can't, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> and I said, you know what, here, honestly, I, I'm a Christian. I said, I don't know what you are, but I'm a Christian, I'm a believer in Jesus. And, and I feel like I'm supposed to pray for you right now. Is that okay? And so I start to pray for her. And really, you know, for me, like prayers and generally is just set up to, you know, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to this person? I want to prophesy to, I want, you know, what specifically do you want to show them? Because, you know, there's not a, most people I've met in evangelism, they want to know two things, even the unsaved. Mm -hmm. And some Christians do. They have these questions in their heart. But most people have two questions. Is God real? Okay, number one. And if he's real, does he think about me? Prophecy answers both those things so quickly. And so I, I begin to I begin to speak. I said, you know what? I'm sitting here praying for you. I have what I feel like are some, some impressions from God's spirit. And um, I want to share what those impressions are with you. And so I, I rattled off about eight different things that the Lord showed me in that moment. And she just went to mush. Mm. And when she got herself together, she said, Every single one of those things you said is exactly what I'm dealing with. Exactly. How did you know that? I said, oh, that's great. So Holy Spirit is God. I'm a Christian. I believe, you know, God's in you know, one and three, three and one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and he knows you intimately. Knows everything about you. Knows things about you you don't even know. And... He just wants you to know that he loves you and he thinks about you. And so he sent me here today, someone who doesn't know you at all, to show you the reality of his love and care and thoughtfulness towards you. I said, do you know how he lives in me? She's like, how? I said, because Jesus Christ, God the Son, he died on the cross for my sins. And yours too, by the way, the whole world's. And when he died, he was buried for three days. He took back the, the keys of death, hell, and the graves. I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear hell anymore because I've, 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 I've believed on his cross. I've believed in him. And not only did he die, he rose again from the dead. And it says he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's returning one day for me and, uh, and all who believe in him. And I said, because I believe in that, the Bible says that his Holy Spirit will come and live inside of me. And I said, you can have the same thing. And she's just, she's just breaking down. She's like, my mom has been telling me for years I need to get right with God. I used to believe, but this and this and that happened. And, you know, she ends up in a rededication type moment, rededication, salvation. I, re I don't care you want to parse it. The reality was is she was afar from the Lord, and God brought her near and gave her a, an encounter and the firm things to her that no one else would ever know outside of him and brought her into a reality of his love and relationship and desire for relationship with her. And she responded with a yes. So I hope she's doing well today. I don't know. But, wow. but man, I, I just believe that. Like there's so much that's available that's untapped because we're not walking in the boldness that's been provided for us if we will just seek it. Right. So obviously, you started with a yes somewhere. Sure. Where was your yes? Oh my gosh! Mm. It's an incredible story, by the way. I love it. Well, so my yes, my yes. I think. Uh, I mean, how far back do you want to go? You want to go like start at the beginning. The like testimony, like. How I sure. got saved, or kind of like yeah, sure. that, that phase of my life, how mm -hmm. God got me. Okay, sure. so, so I was. I don't even know if I've ever heard it. So yeah, no, it's yeah. It's, it's cool. So I was five years old, um, 
in Savannah, Georgia. That's where we lived at the time. I'm not from there, but we lived there briefly. Uh, and my grandmother shared the gospel with me. So I was just acting a fool as a five-year-old. Mm. I think I started cussing because I heard some of my uncles cussing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I want to cuss like they cuss. <laughs> so I started running around just saying what they said, you know? Yeah. And so here's this little kid running around cussing my grandma. You know, she's, she's from like deep Pentecostal. Never even had her yeah. ears pierced. Mm. She walked in your house and found a deck of cards. She'd throw them out. Okay, yep. so she's pretty legalistic, all right. Sure, but she loved Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm glad she loved Jesus. You know, yeah. I, I had an old, I had a pastor of mine. He said, you know, he said, uh, in these last days, I'd rather be a little too churchy than not churchy enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that's, that's back when you, you didn't ascend to the didn't, didn't dare come near the pulpit without a tie on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fire baptized. Hey, right. There's a reverence, and that's okay. Yeah. It's how you demonstrate that reverence, you know. Sure. And so yeah. I'm not mocking it, but it was yeah. just to give you context. Mm -hmm. But um, she, uh, so she said, like you, you, you know what? Jesus is not pleased with that. He didn't make you for that. And so she shared the gospel with me. And invited me to ask the Lord into my heart. And I remember feeling just, I think like, like John Wesley said, I felt my heart within me felt strangely warmed. Mm. And what I can say is that there was a difference in me from that day forward. Um, I started having dreams. I started having visions. Now, I didn't know what to do with it. Neither did anyone around me really have a whole, really know what to do with it. Um, but there was a growing sensitivity to the presence of God. I remember being in church services and being able to sense when the presence of God was stronger than when it wasn't. I could sense when the anointing was stronger on the minister than when it wasn't. I would, when, when it was especially anointed, I'd walk up to the preacher after service and say, you did really good today, pastor. <laughs> my face just beaming. Yeah. And that was just all I could, that was my way of saying, man, that was so anointed. Thank you so much. I can't tell you what was said in those, in those but I could feel the, the power of God resonating within me right. on it. And so uh, then at seven years old in East Park Church of God in Anchorage, Alaska, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, there was a, a female evangelist, which, which back then, so I'm 39 years old to put this in context. This is somewhere in the 90s, uh, at least in the Pentecostal circles um, where really women in ministry were probably more open than, than other uh, denominations or groups. At the time, it mm -hmm. still was a little, little weird. Um, this this older lady, she was from Australia, her name was Shirley Jones. Uh, she came and ministered. Her testimony was was that she contracted polio when she was younger and was bedridden. Well, Oral Roberts was having a tent meeting in Australia near her. And I forget how it was organized, but someone made it so they were literally bringing the sick out in ambulances and bring him into the meeting. And Ora Roberts laid hands on her and prayed for her, and she rose up out of her bed and was wow. totally healed from polio. Wow. And she was like, I am giving my life to this. And she can I cannot tell wow. you what that woman preached, but as a seven-year-old kid, when the altar call was made, I hit that altar, and I just wept and wept and wept and kind of played that game with God like I love you more than Mm -hmm. I kept thinking of things that I would really desire or want. And uh, I mean, like whether it was like a big like piece of gold or like my favorite toy or the whole world. I, I ran out of things. Like, I just love you more than anything, Jesus. And I remember just having this just, just fire for God inside me, this desire. And then there was another time when I was around 11, 12 years old where the Lord began to pour to me more and more and more and more. And that's when I was, I was called to preach. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't me that said I want to be called. I was riding with my dad. Um, in this pickup truck in Palmer, Alaska. This is just north of Anchorage, Alaska. And he said, you know, um, my pastor at the time was a guy named, I believe it was Stephen Ainsworth. I don't know, his last name was Ainsworth. And uh, it was Palmer, Palmer Church of God. And uh, he said, uh, you know, Pastor Ainsworth and, and our other pastor when we lived in Anchorage, uh, Pastor Timothy Bass, he said, you know, they both told me they think you're called to ministry. You're called to, to be a preacher. And I just broke down crying. Mm. and I just responded with a yes. And so it started there, and like many young people, your yes gets tested, Yeah, and you get distracted. 
And so for me, we kind of we we had some some traumatic happenings in my family um, that that weren't let's say traumatic like crazy at that time, but um, just shook up the spiritual order in our house. So my grandfather had a massive stroke just months after that moment. Mm. And he was the real patriarch of the family. He's the one that made sure everyone was, he had five sons. He's the one that made sure that they were at church. Like, hey, you gonna be at church? I mean, I mean even like these guys are grown men. They're in their 20s, they're mm. in the you know, early 30s. Like, you gonna be at church? And so as soon as he wasn't there, he said, you gonna be at church? Yeah. No one yeah. was at church. Mm. Now they were at the hospital with him on Sundays. And honestly, I think, and it was, kind of, it was, I get, you know, they were giving that time to him. But I honestly think that if my grandfather could have communicated to them, because he couldn't really do that very well because of his stroke, right. I think if I could, if he, if if you had told him, hey, hey, Ned Senior, you're going to have a stroke here, and you're going to be out of commission in terms of communication. Mm-hmm. Your mental faculties won't be there. You're not going to be able to lead your family. What's a what's a spiritual will you leave him? I guarantee it would be study the word have a life of prayer, take your kids to church no matter what. And he would much rather have them consistently in the house of God than with him all day Sunday. But that sure. was, I felt like that was, it almost felt like that was kind of an out. Like we don't do this anymore because we're over here with with dad. Yeah. And so I was at a church for a long time. <clears throat> wow. And, and so waffled in and out of this hunger for God. Anyhow, fast forward I'm in my teenage years, starting to have a hunger stir for, for the Lord, not really going to church, but I'm bringing my Bible to school, I'm reading it, I'm feeling the presence of God. Other people are getting touched, and then I get some girlfriend, and then I'm just gone. Yeah. <laughs> Same old story. Same old, yeah. I mean, it's happened to a million, the, the billions of men over time. And, you know, that's not her fault. That was my fault, but but anyhow. Um, and then I get my teenage years, and then my uh, I went to work for my father, and got into business with him, and things just went really it went. We were good for a little bit, then went really south. He got in some trouble, um, ended up getting into some white collar crime type stuff, and he went to he went to prison for about three and a half years, mm-hmm. uh, federal federal prison, which was kind of a. It was. I mean, I was aware of what was going on and participated in some of it to a measure. It was. A, it was. It was an incredible miracle. I didn't go to jail myself. Especially, I mean, I literally during this time period, God had gotten a hold of me. As I went, I started going back to church not because I was hurrying for God, because I had moved from Florida to Tennessee, and I didn't know anybody, mm. and so I wanted friends. I really wanted a girlfriend. But I thought, well, I don't. I've never been into the club scene, and what if I go and meet some chick at a bar, and fall in love with her and make a family with her? Like that's not going to be really what I want. I might marry someone crazy. You know, like I want to serve. I want a godly woman. I was not a godly man, but I wanted at least a godly woman. And so I went to this Baptist church because they had the best looking women. And <laughs> no, seriously, I'm just being honest with you. That was my yeah. motivation. My motivation was trash. <laughs> it was trash. And I'm in this young adults group. This guy's a great teacher. He's a, he is Pentecostal and at a Baptist church. And, but really just, he was, he was amazing. <laughs> but I'm telling you, like, they're just girls that were just knockouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just could not take, I tried it for about six weeks. I had some friends I had met that went there. Mm-hmm. But I just like, man, I need more than this. <laughs> I had enough spiritual awareness. And that was probably a great church. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and obviously I was in no place to judge anybody. Sure. All right. I was I had zero motivation <laughs> right. that was godly. And so anyhow, I heard about this church that was not too far from my house, Woodward Avenue Church of God in, in, in Athens, Tennessee. And I go there, and there's a few cute girls. Um, <laughs> but man, I could just feel the presence of God. And man, the Lord just tricked me. Net didn't didn't meet a single girl ever dated there, but uh, <laughs> but but got reconnected with the Lord in a powerful way. I remember one night being in the altars, and these two, you know, like you get those couple old guys that just love the Lord. Yeah, you know, they're not ordained or anything like that, but mm-hmm. but they they are tight with Jesus. Sure. And they came over one night, and laid hands on me, and. I just went down like, and I was not someone who was going to give you a courtesy flop. Right. And, you know, they wouldn't let me go. So I'm, I'm down and the one's like, lays hands right here. 
The other one's like hands my stomach and they're just like <laughs> praying that I'd get the baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And it was like all of a sudden someone uncorked something inside of me and whoosh, yeah, tongues just came flowing out. Mm. And I was like, holy cow, what is this? Now, in the meantime, I'm still kind of being a scallywag. <laughs> and I'm wrestling with God. It's like yeah. I want my, I want to do what I'm doing over here, but yeah, I want, it was, it was like I just couldn't get away from it. Yeah. And on the inside, I'm still wrestling with this, with this, this idea of you're called. Yeah. You're, you're, you're called. I want to make sure I don't hit this light over oh, yeah. here. Yeah. I'm gonna sit up straight. I feel kind of weird leaning back. <laughs> it's okay. But you got your feet kicked up in a lazy boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, man, I have, I have this. Um, I had this wrestling going on, and so I'm like, I'm a one foot in, one foot out type guy. I remember yeah. during that time, go. I had one of my best, my best friend that lived here because I'd moved from here to to Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, he was at Auburn University, and so he invited me to come down and hang out. So I go and do the thing you did at the university. Then I went and you know had too much to drink and messed around and all that kind of stuff. And and but I wanted to drive back home that night to get to get into Sunday to get to Sunday service because I wanted to go out and eat with my friends mm-hmm. before work that next week. It was just social. Yeah. It was all it was. So I drove up from Auburn to Athens with a hangover, just basically sipping on Pepto Bismol on the way up there, feeling like I had been, you know, just through the ringer. Mm-hmm. And I show up just in time for the altar call with oh, some wow. missionary from like Guatemala or something like that. Mm-hmm. I walk in the door and, he, and he, I mean, I kid you not, I walk in the door to the sanctuary and he says, there's a young man here. You've been called by God a long time ago and you are not living. You're running from him right now. You're not living for him. The Lord says you need to turn around right now. You need to repent and you need to come down here and humble yourself. And I was like, Say no more. You got me. Yeah. So I walked up there. One other guy walked up there. I don't know. I mean, maybe it was for him too, but I'm like, this is definitely for me. Sure. And just got, just rocked by God. But again, I, I was kind of like, unsta- I was still unstable. Yeah. And so I ended up, um, I ended up, uh, things started getting shaken up with the business. Uh, things just went really sideways. Um, and that's a whole other long story of how all, all how all of that went down, but um, I just I got humbled big time, and I remember I remember what what hit me so hard. Oh, so a couple things in that time frame. Um, one was the pastor of our church and those ends up having to resign because he's having an affair with a woman he's counseling. Mm. So. I, that didn't, for whatever reason, maybe it's just my hardness of heart, it didn't really affect me. Right. So my attitude was like, well, he's just a man. Yeah. You know, he, he whatever God did in me, God did in me. If he used him, fine, but whatever he had going on, it wasn't, I'm not going to discount, I'm not going to discount what God did because he was in sin, you know. Sure. Um, and so we had the state overseer come one night to talk about, you know, the process of getting a new pastor and all that. And, I really just want to know what was going on with the church, to be honest with you. I was just curious yeah. while I was there. And so while he's up there preaching, he never really answered any kind of questions. He just preached a word and tried to just bring you know a steady hand into the house. And mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you know, you're called to do what he's doing. And I didn't want to at all. With all this stuff that went on before, I was just hard-headed, stiff-necked. Sure. And I just start crying. I'm like, God, I do not want to be some broke preacher. But I had this inward sense that even though God created free will, he has this wild power of limiting your choices. So while he doesn't break, he doesn't vi- while he won't violate your free will, he might bring that free will to a place where it's like live or die. And I felt like I was coming to one of those places. Mm. And so I just said, Lord, okay. I said, you're going to have to change my mind. You're going to have to change my heart. I'll change my mind. And uh, I'm going to give this a shot, but you got to do a deep work in me. So I said, I'm changing my mind right now. 
I'm going to say yes to you, but you got to change my heart. So the first thing I did is I threw out all my, you know, back then you had CDs. <laughs> so I threw out, I don't know how many hundreds of dollars worth of CDs. So yeah. Every bit of music that I had in my collection that was not godly was gone. And I was left with like a Gaither Homecoming CD. <laughs> <laughs> And, and like, I think an Elvis Presley gospel CD, okay? That's where I was left. Neither are good choices. Yeah, so I, <laughs> yeah. and so I, I went I went to the uh, the local Bible bookstore. And, well, not the local one, the one in, in Cleveland, Tennessee, which is pretty large, like Pathway or something like that. I can't remember. But I go there, and I have no idea. I was not a fan of any kind of contemporary Christian music, nothing like that. I thought all this was not good. And so I end up, you know, so at that time you had to buy a whole CD. Yeah. Oh, which yeah. you might get two songs that were good. So I was always right. like, if I'm, if I'm going to look at a new genre, I want a greatest hits. Sure. And so I see this cardboard cutout, this guy named Michael W. Smith. Mm. And uh, he has a greatest hits CD. He just came out with him. I'm like, well, you know, let's give this a shot. And so I, you know, I put it in my truck and I'm driving down the, I buy it, put it in my truck, drive down the road. And I'm like, yeah, all right, it's good. Yeah, fine, fine. And then all of a sudden, there's a song called Missing Person. Mm. And I, I, it talks about basically how he was this on fire kid for God. And where'd that person go? I'm looking for that missing person. I just broke down in my truck. I was like, holy cow, God is talking to me. So I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, if you have to, if you have to break me down from the man I've become back into the child I was so that you can make me into the man you want me to be. Sure. And so that that weekend, like everything came totally unhinged. Like I actually, I mean, because of the stuff that was going on in my dad's business and all that, I mean, I thought I was going to jail or something, you know, because I was an accessory to some of this stuff. It's white collar done. And and um, I ended up going. We had a young adults uh, retreat to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, that day mm-hmm. or that weekend. I was like, I'm going to go to this and I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> uh, when I get back, you were serious. Yeah, I was like, my toast. last steak dinner, and, and I was going to no, jail. I was. Yeah. Yeah, I was and, that, and my attitude was, was garbage. Like, well, pff, man. So I kind of you know, like, and I wasn't like, I don't deserve this. I'm like, yeah, I, you know what, I've I've screwed up. I made some bad choices. Yeah, but you know, I, and whatever. So I kind of got the attitude like, this is my last weekend of fun, and so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go for it. And so I go there and I'm, we're skiing, we're doing all kinds of stuff. And so we were having, excuse me, <laughs> that, 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 that snuck up on me. <laughs> so, um, the, the gentleman who was leading our young adults group, uh, he was a, uh, professor at the theological seminary, uh, for the church of God in Cleveland there. And he had one of his students, he and his wife come and, uh, they ministered that weekend and I just didn't like them. Yeah. To me, they just seemed like stuck up and religious. And they it wasn't that. They're good folks. I was a jerk. That was my real problem. Right. Is I was a jerk. <laughs> There's nothing wrong. Probably great people. Yeah. But it was just, to me, I was like, this feels showy. This feels doesn't feel authentic. doesn't feel real. And I was just, the truth was, I was really authentically messed up. Yeah. And so I had a really bad filter. Mm-hmm. And um, so I just was like, I don't want to hear this guy's preaching, none of this stuff. And and so on top of it, one night they're having this uh, like spaghetti dinner night. And I hated, at that time in my life, I just hated spaghetti. It was my least favorite food. And so I said, I'm going to the Cherokee Grill. And whoever wants to come with me, I'm buying. But I'm not sitting here and eating spaghetti tonight. So two of my good friends, they left with me. So I went and steaks, whatever, grabbed a few beers, came back. Made it, you know, I was so I was skied all day and buzzed when I made it to the, <laughs> the, the to the the service that evening. Yeah, I wanted to be in bed, not there. So the guy did this message on the contrast between David and Saul, and um, I slept through most of it. Jeez, you know, you did that thing like when you you kind of pick one of the back rows and you put your hand like this, so you look like you're in like deep meditative contemplation, but you're actually. Sleeping. Yeah. So someone woke me up during the altar call. And my response was really poor anyways. <laughs> it like hit me, like hit my knee or something like that. And yeah. And anyhow, so they do that. I'm just waiting to get through with it. And they uh they have communion afterwards. And so Ken Dr. Dr. Ken Archer was 
our college and career professor, brilliant, brilliant theologian, and great guy. I love him to death. He and his wife Melissa. Uh, so they uh, they we're doing communion, and they say, you know, we're just looking forward to seeing you all in heaven one day. And this guy, this this redneck who I hated, his name was Joel. I mean, the most redneck dude ever. He's crying. And this guy was just a mess. He's someone like I just wanted to, at the time, we actually became pretty good friends afterwards. Uh, but he ended up, um, he ended, he, but at the time he was just, uh, he was just a mess. He was just a mess and I didn't like him. Our demons didn't like each other. And I, I was looking for an excuse to fight him, to be honest with you. And he, he raises up his look me cup and says, Kenny, not even like Dr. Ken. Mm -hmm. Not even like, you know, passion. Kenny, he's squalling. He's like, if the Lord doesn't change my heart right now, brother, I ain't going to make it. <laughs> exactly. Like, this is, it was kind of comical, but yeah. this compassion came over me. Sure. That I knew it was God because I had no compassion for this guy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And Ken says, well, Joel, come on up here. I'm going to pray for you. And... And we're gonna get this right tonight. And so I go. I feel like I like the Lord's just launching him out of my seat. And I go up there, and Doctor Ken starts praying, and I lay hands on him. And what I didn't realize was going on it was like prophetic, but also deliverance. Mm -hmm. It was like the words were just coming in my heart and out my mouth, and it was just pointed, prophetic. And as I'm calling things out in him, he's just like, it's like things are just coming off of him. It's like he's being delivered here. And he just got wrecked, and then. Dr. Ken says, there's someone else you're supposed to pray for. And the same thing happens. Mm. And I'm like, holy cow. Like, I didn't know this was possible. Like, this felt better than anything I'd ever accomplished before in my life in terms of, like, just, like, I was being used by God for real. Yeah. And Ken says, there's one last person we're supposed to pray for. And not only are we supposed to pray for him, but the Lord has a specific word for him. And that's the first time I've been prophesied over. So he calls, he calls me up. And he lays his hands on me and he says, and it says, thus says the Lord thy God, like Saul, I made you tall, like Saul, I made you handsome, but you will not be like Saul, for I, the Lord your God, have placed much in your hands, but you must be, stay faithful and disciplined in me. Mm. And I just dropped to the ground, and I cried and cried until I had no tears left, and then I just dry cried. And it was like God took a roll, like, like you ever seen those books? that you just flip it real fast and it's like this animated thing where there's just moving pictures mm -hmm. on it. It was like God took all my sin and just... And I had like a rapid fire repentance. Wow. And I got up and I was like, you know what, Lord, I, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm yours. You've convinced me. And so, uh, yeah, I... By that time, a few weeks later, we had a, a new pastor and I told him that I was called by the Lord you know, and how do I move forward? Uh, it's kind of a little bit of my backstory and testimony. And so I started uh, my working towards getting credentialed uh, with the Church of God and went through the training they offered me um, through their minister, minister and training program. Took some courses through their school of ministry and uh, did that. Ended up down uh, here. God moved me uh, to Florida. I mean, this, I don't want to take up a lot of time with all this. But, anyways, Long story short, come down here, um, get to work, try to do some ministry stuff. Nothing's really working. End up at CI and just get wrecked. Because I'm experiencing the prophetic like I thought. I'm experiencing the prophetic in action the way that coming from the church of God, they described was going to be possible one day when the Lord did a great, when the Lord would do a great last day's outpouring. Mm. But I'm seeing this in action now. Mm-hmm. And so I just realized at that moment, I actually wanted to plant a church. And I just put that on hold because I realized there was something I was missing. Go to that, end up meeting this girl, get married, um, but was compromised. Still, my, my aching thing in my heart was, is for whatever reason, you know, I, uh, I was very insecure with women. And I very much craved that affirmation and attention. Sure. And I compromised myself. I ended up marrying a girl who just wasn't, um, we, we had no business dating. I don't think she was ready. I wasn't ready. And um, she came out of a worldly lifestyle. 
it's kind of like a more of a new convert type thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that she saw me as a pretty spiritual person, which maybe compared to some of the guys that were around, I was, um, and latched onto me. Um, and and uh, anyhow, about a year and a half later, she just chose to go back into the worldly lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And so that marriage dissolved on, on biblical grounds. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was just broken again. I was like, holy crap, cow. I am now a divorced man. Uh, for me, like that yeah. was such a big deal in, in the church of God. I mean, you know, I, it was biblical. Re- I will not go into details of it or whatever, but, but I had the biblical right to divorce, move on be, and be clean. I tried everything I could to work it out, but ultimately she, she did not want to at mm-hmm. all. She was adamant about it. And so, um, you know, biblically covenant had been broken legally. It was, and so I was just broken. So I kind of felt like I was just worthless. I had a lot of religious condemnation. And so I kind of backslid, not not into any kind of sexual sin or whatever, but I started drinking. And it was about a four, four or five month period of my life. And finally one day, I was having, I was working at my, I was working at my job, and I met this guy who was a minister, an entrepreneur, and literally my same age, and had almost the exact same story as me. He went through a divorce, almost the exact same issue with his, his wife. It was insane, but he had had this, this, this like crazy restoration. It was because he had a restoration, not since he got back with her, but just of his life and his calling and everything. But through the whole period, he sought God. Mm. And I was selling him a car, and we were talking about God stuff, and he's, you know, I'm just shooting, shooting the breeze with him. And he gets up to leave, and he's going to pick up the car the next day. And the Lord says, wow, man, the Holy Spirit speaks to my heart and says, wow, you, man, you were really able to talk all that church stuff with him. That was great. And I was like, yeah, yeah, Lord. I'm, I'm. He said, you know, it's, it's funny, you're kind of bilingual. And I was like, what? He said, oh, you can, you can rap with the world and with the church folks. You really know how to, you know, really know how to act. And it, he was, he was just nailing me on my inauthenticity. Mm. And so the guy had started talking about a man named Leonard Ravenhill and how awesome Leonard Ravenhill was. And David Wilkerson, I never heard of the two guys. And so I just, after realizing God was not happy with me, um, I ended up listening to those guys. And my my life got radically changed. And I just realized, I mean, there's probably more, more to it, but the Lord just made it very clear to me, clear to me that, that, that the how I was living in terms of the drinking and just whatever came with that, it's like, I did not make you for this, and I'm done with this phase of your life. Mm-hmm. Do you understand me? That's clear that I ever heard the Lord say. He's like, this is, like, if you don't if you don't turn around right now, this is it. Like, I, like and I don't, I'm not saying that meant in terms of, like, my salvation, I was going to lose it, but I feel like I was very much at risk of losing my calling. Yeah. And, like, I'd be just done. Sure. And so I went back, and that same prayer, I prayed, Lord... I'm going to change my mind, but you got to change my heart. I prayed that and then spent like the next probably six months going through a season of like deep fasting and prayer and listening to David Wilkerson and Lana Ravenhill every day and just getting just slapped upside my head about what an idiot I was in the most beautiful way possible. Yeah. You know, (laughs) I mean, those guys, they preach very straight. Yep. But out from that, that hunger for revival and for, personal repentance and to to see people reached in the street was birthed out of that season. Mm-hmm. And so I started sharing with my friends, even from church, what I was going through and they started getting convicted. They mean like, God, like ministry students there mm-hmm. and that they weren't anything into anything crazy or something like that, but they started getting convicted and, and, and we began to start praying together. And then we had this formalized group and then that's where out of that, going back to where I was, God broke our heart for ourselves and for the lost. Mm-hmm. And we started reaching people. And we started having, I mean, prayer meetings that would last four or five, six hours sometimes. You need to kick people out of the house. Was that the group you called Crying Out? Crying Out, yeah. yeah. That went on for years. Yeah. Until, and just, you know, until, you know, the Lord was just basically, that movement was basically over that phase, that season. I remember the, the meeting where it happened. It just felt like, not that we were doing anything bad, but God just wasn't breathing on it like it was. And then right. things started to transition not long after that. 
for about a year or two after that, I, I actually planted a church here in Fort Walton Beach. My wife and I did out of, gotcha. in partnership with CI in Santa Rosa Beach. Mm-hmm. So, and that's kind of what got you here to pastoring. That's what got me here. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to come here. Um, I didn't want to pastor for starters. I wasn't interested yeah. in pastoring. I thought pastoring was something that God would do to me later on when I was more mature. Yeah. Um, I liked traveling and ministering. I didn't feel like I had a pastoral bone in my body. Yeah. Um, I understand. That's that. not my proclivity. Really. Mm-hmm. I've had to grow in that. And really, I think the reason why I didn't have much of a pastoral bone in my body is I was still working through some of my own stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I was raised, yeah. I was raised, and I had parents that loved me and I'm grateful for them, but were tough. Sure. You know, and so I felt like what everyone needed to straighten out was they needed, to, you know, to get shaken up, sh- shaken up. I didn't get the, the, the soft, um, compassionate side of the Lord. Yeah. I thought like we need tough love. You're a bunch of, you know, hoodlums. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. But, yeah. it, but anyhow, yeah. So, um, we just, we had, we had received a prophetic word from a, a minister outside of our, um, outside of our, our, our network of, of, of friends that just, just didn't know us at all really and prophesied about us, um, God calling us to plant a church, et cetera. And it was very witnessing with me because God had started to really stir something like that in me, even though I didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think it was for some later time. Um, and then we ended up getting another word. We shared that with our, with our leaders and some close friends of ours just to pray and meditate on and seek the Lord. And then another prophet, a man, man named Jim LaFoon, came to CI, who was a regular there, and called me out and my wife and prophesied a very similar word, mm-hmm. affirming that. And it just came down to where to go. And I wanted to plant in Destin, Florida, because I'd sown so much there. And we had a lot of relationships. We had a lot of people there that I think would have probably um, been happy to back that. Um, But I wasn't settled on it. And so um, I remember I was going to make a decision. I felt like I needed to make a decision. And I had an email written out to my leaders. Like, I feel like Destin's the place. But I said, Lord, I'm not settled on it. You've always been good to speak to me in dreams. Um, if you have a different plan for me, give me a dream. And I had one of the most realistic dreams I've ever had in my life that night. And it was basically about a... It was I was in Fort Walton Beach, and God showed me some things in a dream about the spiritual condition of the city, and that our assignment was to help to really reawaken... Um, there was like a, a there was like a a, a man, whatever you want to call it like a, a, a mantle a well I'm throwing out all the charismatic adjectives <laughs> but there was a call for revival here that had went dormant mm. and we were called to be here to labor here to help awaken it and so we've just been honest I, mean, I can't stand and say that we say that we've we've fully accomplished that at all um, but we've just stayed faithful to what we feel like the Lord's called us to do here. Mm-hmm. And just kept plugging away at it, and so we have a, a local church here. You know that it's 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 healthy, and God's doing good things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges uh, facing pastors on a weekly basis that congregants don't even know about? Mm, that's a great question. Mm. I think. Well, I don't know. I could throw out some statistics, um, but I guess it kind of depends on your context and what sure. your metrics are. I think the, the biggest thing is that we need to have heaven's metrics on what makes for a successful ministry. Mm-hmm. If we don't use heaven's metrics, it's easy to slip into, into discouragement or compromise. And so um, for me, I think there's a lot of tension between that. You know, pastors really care about how well you're doing. Mm. I think the biggest challenge I've I've recognized with being a pastor is is people treat you like you're a product instead of a person. Mm. Um, and that's because we have a consumeristic mentality in the church. Yeah. And so, with that, I think that's the that's the hardest thing is is we're called to really embrace people in our full hearts mm-hmm. to love them no matter where they are. I mean, I've seen people from all kinds of just crazy backgrounds. And so we care, we labor, we try to keep tender hearts, 
but kind of when uh, when just at the end of the day you're treated like you're treated like a, a a product or a service and not a person you know yeah what I found is people there's a lot of biblical ignorance in the body of Christ because um, there's a lot of we're waiting through an age of very shallow preaching yeah that's very self-centric and I think it's it's it has so in an effort to reach a broader audience of people, we've bred a very narcissistic breed of Christian. Mm-hmm. It's all about what can you do for me? What can God do for me? What can, and it's, it's not people don't people when they, when people seek out a church to be a part of, I found that often. Now let me preface this with, we have great people at our church. It's by no means a, a, a thing to say about everyone who is at our church or has ever been to our church for a time or a season. Um, but what I've noticed the problems I see with a lot of folks is, is they, they look at a church as far as what can I get out of it, not in the lens of where has God called me and how can I serve mm-hmm. and be a part, be, be a, a vibrant part of that body. And so what happens is, is, is that I guess for, for me, where I've had to, re- had to kind of realize is that not everyone views the church the same way I do. And I don't, I don't mean my church specifically when I lead, I'm saying the broader body. Mm-hmm. And so I've had to realize I can't be so naive to think that everyone is here for the right reasons. And I don't, it doesn't, for, let me say this, it doesn't matter to me if they're there for the right reasons or not. What matters to me is they're there and I want to help them grow in, in the, in the Lord. But when someone has a consumeristic mentality and and they bump up against the truth of God and that doesn't feel good to them because they've been taught this kind of western shallow narcissistic self-centered version of 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 of, of Christianity mm-hmm. when you, they come face to face I'd say especially like in a crisis or counseling situation and they have to deal with the fact that their sinful behavior has greatly contributed to the crisis they're in and then you give them truth Often they hate you for telling them that truth. Yeah. And then they leave. And then usually they lie about why they left. Usually they, there's, there's, um, and then you hear chatter around and about, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you're always the bad guy. You're a legalist, you know. Yeah. Um, which is so, common. which is so hysterical. You're not a legalist because you think we should obey the, the Bible. Mm-hmm. Jesus, the Pharisees, really legalistic because they believed that not washing your hands before a meal in between courses was tantamount to adultery, <laughs> and you would be you would be be sat down as a rabbi if you didn't wash your hands before before your meal in between courses. You were you were stripped of your position to teach. That's legalism. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say you're being a Pharisee. Like, really? What do you know about the Pharisees? Please tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Jesus didn't like them. Like, oh, well, let me tell you more about them and what legalism actually is. Yeah. <laughs> it's not saying legalism is not you shouldn't fornicate with your girlfriend. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's not legalism. <laughs> Grace does not empower you to fornicate. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but anyhow, so you see that, and then they go off. You, you give them this this advice, and they go off, and they and they 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 make a mess yeah. by pursuing what they want, and then they come back to you a year, two years later, wanting you to fix it. Yeah, but they still won't take your counsel to look at someone and say, "With all due respect, I love you, but you don't do anything I ask you to do." Yeah. So this is a waste of time for you and I, mm-hmm. in in genuinely in in love, and so it's it's kind of that would say that's that's the thing. So so, what is a pastor? A pastor's done with more warfare than you think. Mm-hmm. I remember a day, where I was working with this this person, having a discipleship type thing, and and they they made a mess of some stuff, and I had to deal with it, and I got treated so contemptuously, so dishonoring, mm-hmm. and I didn't buck up and say you know. Hey, I'm a I'm your pastor. You don't talk to me like that, or excuse me, you know some, something to that to that measure. They were exiting out anyways because in that moment God called them to go somewhere else. As mm-hmm. soon as I confronted them with this issue, right? And so literally got ran down like I was just the worst of the worst in that moment. And then about ten minutes later, get a text message from someone else I'd, I'd been discipling, mentoring, just saying, I just want to let you know that. Uh, 
your, your, your leadership in my life has been the most transformational experience I've had outside just personal relationship with God. I've grown so much under your care and your leadership. It's been astounding. And I'm just honor you and appreciate you. You're the best pastor I've ever had. And so, I mean, you can, I could even see in that, like, okay, I'm going through this, but God's showing me, hey, you, you, you're not terrible. Yeah. But it's sad, like, I couldn't actually fully enjoy that. Sure. Because of, of this over here. And so the big thing I realized is, I realized was really this. It's not, I'm not starting to say, you know, oh, poor, poor pastor, but it's that, you, you know, if you're not doing it for Jesus, you're going to be disappointed. Totally. Because, and, and how much yeah. have I been disappointed? I've been a problem child for some pastors before. You know, and so, you know, people are mature and they do wild things. But I just say, so your pastors are doing more warfare and they need more encouragement than you think they need. And the greatest encouragement isn't you telling them they did a good job. Your greatest encouragement is your presence. Mm. That's the greatest encouragement, you know. And then also, I'd say just, um, you know, the uh, one thing about being a pastor is this is that, especially because there's a counseling element to that, you know. Um, it's recognize that your leader may not have you, you you may have friends you can go and blow off steam and talk about what you're going what you're dealing with your pastor probably doesn't have yeah someone like that and if they do have someone like that they're probably not as easy to get a hold of as you think mm-hmm. so it can be very isolating now fortunately I have I have confidential people I can you know talk about situations with but, but even then, it's not necessarily the most, like, I just pick up the phone and say, hey, hey, bud, you gotta, guess what? It's another busy person that's going through the same kind of stuff I'm going through. Yeah, probably another pastor. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Someone older, wiser, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. So that's just, and the thing, you know, and the and through all that, you know, personal lives, kids, finances, bills, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so got to show up and, you know, minister. Yeah. And, you know, we have days where we don't feel like being at the church. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. <laughs> I've had you got 27 like, kids. So. If, if, if I, yeah, I got six kids. They're like, <laughs> if I was not the pastor, I would take a Sunday off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe a whole weekend. <laughs> but, 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 but you're there. You know, and I'd say that. That's, I would say, and, I, and that's not so much an issue. Kind of things I'm describing now. That's so much an issue. Right now, there's still weights. There's still more work for people to know. But you grow in the midst of it. That's one thing I've been very grateful about. God trusting us with this with this call to pastors. It's it's it's, it's created a lot of of growth in us. You know, I heard mm-hmm. one gentleman. I can't remember his name, but he was on a uh, a panel uh, discussion that I got to to hear, and he had a really wild story about stuff the Lord had taken him through, and as as a pastor, and he said. Talking about the disappointment of like what you go through with 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 people, um, and he said, "I had to realize that as a pastor, I'm called to the ministry of Hosea. Mm. I'm called to love, care for, go above and beyond for what will be many an unfaithful person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you have to reconcile with that." And again, that's not to trash people. Sure. It's not here saying, oh, the sheep are just garbage. No, I'm not. People are far more complex than we could ever imagine. Yeah. And not everyone has your story. Right. What has gotten me in more trouble with people than anything else, and I would do this early on, even before I was pastoring, was assuming that they had a similar relationship to God that I did. Right. Or a similar experience mm-hmm. with God that I've had. Right. I can I can teach you the word. I can preach to you. I can encourage you. I cannot impart my history with God to you. Sure. And so recognizing the reason I respond to certain situations the way I do is largely because of the history I have with God. Yeah. And you, 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 you deal with people, they just, for whatever reason, they haven't had those encounters yet. So I just realized you have to be so much more patient than you could ever imagine pastoring. Yeah. 
and really, really understand that it's not at all about you. It's totally about Jesus. And the thing about, you know, I just say being a leader, and I'd, I'd say this, not being a leader, just being a Christian. Yeah. We would be shocked if we sat down with ourselves and had a, had a Sabbath where we really tuned everything out and used it, took a day just to reflect on the tr- with the Holy Spirit about just the traffic and trajectory of our soul. Mm-hmm. Most would be shocked at how much they're actually living for themselves and not for God. Yeah. And what I mean by that is not intentionally, but if you really narrow it down to why you, you take your disappointments, you take your victories, and you 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 begin to with Holy Spirit dig into the why am I so disappointed in this area? Why am I so excited in this area? And you'll be shocked at how much those things are filtered through the lens of self and not the lens of Christ. Mm-hmm. And we we live in a in a in a in a world that's designed to distract us and to crush our souls. And we're so caught up in the flow of traffic of that. And we're so unrested. I don't mean we're entertained. We're not unentertained. We're not we're not always slack on moments to just kind of relax and chill out. But I mean, we're not rested. We don't take time with God to be still and let him care for our soul. Like he really wants to, I believe. Even in religious duty. Mm -hmm. I got to read this much. I got to pray this much. I need to be a part of this group. I need to be part of that group. And those things are all good and fine. But taking time and letting the Holy Spirit drill down on the why I do what I do yeah. Is missing. And and frankly, it's not really really taught either. Mm-hmm. And the and the I talk about, you know, how we have a consumer driven driven culture where, you know, in the church where you know pastors are products and that's hard. I didn't realize that when I got in the ministry that most people saw their pastor as a product, whether they knew it or not. Um, but the truth is that's how some leaders view people. Mm-hmm. It works both ways. And so I think we, we need to we need to decommodify the church. Sure. And we need to to refamily the church in yeah. many ways. But that's harder than we think because that goes deeper than we realize. Sure. Because a lot of us are doing it unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And would never think we were. Yeah. But I promise you, if people here listening if me even just stopped and, and looked at what am I disappointed in and what I'm excited about and then stop and ask myself, why am I so disappointed in this? Mm. Why am I so excited about this? You'll find a lot that's not rooted in the person of Jesus. It's rooted in yourself. Yeah. And it's where when you flip that and really start start drilling down and watch, being wary of your motives and being 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 more conscious and intentional about engaging Holy Spirit and living a life before Him that's in service to Him. Mm-hmm. I would say, tell everyone, just go read the book of Luke. Do a series of the book of Luke. The book of Luke is, is radically self-crucifying. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we, if we would do that, I think we would alleviate ourselves of some of those issues, you know. Saint Saint Anthony the Great was one of the Desert Fathers, uh, Athanasius, one of the early Church Fathers. He 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 wrote his his biography, and it's probably one of the best early Christian biographies and documents available. I think, I think everyone should read. It's a short read. Probably after that would be Athanasius's um, uh, writing on the Incarnation, which is just some of the most deep Christology you could look to get into, in my opinion. Um, Anthony talks about this in, in, in terms of healing as he had a strong healing ministry and people would come from all over. But I mean, this guy was someone who tried to get away from people. He was in the early monastics, mm-hmm. not to, not to just detach, but to get closer to God. 
but people kept following him and following him and following him. And he had a tremendous healing ministry. And so, I mean, one of those were like, he would discern like what someone had going on before they said anything, before they even arrived and sent someone to tell them, you're healed, go leave, turn around. And they'd be healed in that moment. And go. It's just wild stuff. Um, but he would tell people, he said, he would teach them, if you get healed when I pray for you, don't think it's because you're special. Don't think it's because I'm special. But bless God and rejoice in the Lord. If you don't get healed, don't think it's because you're a problem or I'm a problem or God doesn't love you. But learn to patiently endure mm. and rest in the fact that God is sovereign and has a plan in the midst of this. And it's for the good. Yeah. Don't complain as if you're entitled to or deserve anything because you're not, but rejoice in the Lord anyways. Most of our disappointments are wrapped around the fact that we have a timeline and trajectory that's not rooted in God. It's rooted in desire for affirmation of self and the affirmation of men. We all have a little Pharisee inside of us that needs to be slain. That's probably so wrapped in religion mm -hmm. that we miss him. So we don't slow down and spend time with the Holy Spirit and ask the questions we need to ask. That's powerful. We're going to wrap up here in just a minute, but I did want to ask you one more thing about, well, actually, I wanted to tell you, tell you this real fast because I can relate. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, I can do a lot of different kinds of things because I've been around ministry, for, you know, my entire life. So I've had to like pick up, you know, where people just didn't get things done. You know, like uh -huh. there were times where I had to do production stuff, times where I had to do stuff, you know, with music or sometimes I've had to lead worship, you know, uh -huh. just, just all kinds of, you're a jack of all trades. So you're very useful. I've had to become a jack of all trades in some places. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and in my usefulness, I have become the product to pastors. Sure. Um, and, uh, not just to pastors, but to, to just people in general. But I think it hurts worse, obviously, when it is a pastor mm -hmm. um, because you put your trust in them. They befriend you, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Thoroughly. Um, and um, it is it is sad to see that um, it does kind of shake out that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, like you, I can totally relate to what you said, is I would obviously be mad at the person. But I didn't blame God. Yeah. I didn't think ever think it was God's fault. Because it wasn't God's fault. I mean, everybody has flaws. I see that man as just a man with flaws. Sure. And maybe he, uh, you know, uh, didn't do me the right way. But um, if he ever, you know, wanted to still be friends, I'd forgive and just move on. Totally. You know. Um, but, yeah, I, I totally relate. I think it's a sad day that we live in in some of those regards because I have seen uh, – I have been in full-time ministry where I've worked for churches, and I've seen those people that – those pastors run them like dogs. And yeah. they're it's not – become so corporatized. Yeah, yeah. They're not pastor. They're just employees yes. of the pastor. Yes, yes. Um, and, um, you know, that's just their boss, and they don't really have uh, a pastor. They just have a boss. Mm hmm um, and on the flip side of that, I've also seen sons of pastors that have um, lost their way because they've seen their pastor or their dad because it's so hard to it, – it's a fine line, mm -hmm. you know. It's hard to tell, are you my pastor right now or are you my dad right now? I've been there. My dad was a pastor. Yeah. So I, I get that. Um, and I feel like sometimes some of those people are the hardest to reach or to get back. They're very difficult to get back. Very much. Yeah. Um, very much. And I, I don't know how many, you know, people you've dealt with on that side of things, but I also know, uh, you know, in your church, you might, and you may be able to relate to this, but um, a lot of times in, um, when you're a pastor, you can see through the relationships that these people have had, like with their dad, you know, or their, uh, like a boss or, yeah. or a different pastor, that they almost view you through them. Yeah, that's one of the unfair things about, I think, any kind of leadership is I, I've, I've realized, and I've had people tell me, you know, who maybe I've had issues with in the past, and mm -hmm. they left the church or come back and or say, you know, hey, man, the Lord's really convicted me to let you know that 
I, I didn't see you for who you really were because I was looking at you through the lens mm-hmm. of past leaders and pastors. Sure. You know, and so that's a very real thing. And that's something we ought to watch out for, I yeah. think, because we, we usually, we carry, we can, we can carry a lot of baggage with us. Yeah. And then we just cast that on people who are in similar roles. I mean, would you say that some people even view, like, if they had a really bad relationship with their dad, that they almost view God through the lens of what their dad was to them? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. Sure, yeah. But, but it is, and it's hard to engage, you know, uh, it's hard to engage in the life of the church when you're unfathered. Mm. Um, because you have to learn so much before you can really be used, mm-hmm. that you should learn at home. Bishop uh, Joseph Matera, who's a personal mentor of mine, uh, he pastors, well, he doesn't currently pastor anymore. He's more, more of an apostolic work, but the church he planted and pastored for decades in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, he said this. He said, if we got a, a man in who had had a father in his life, almost whether or not that father was Christian or not, just as long as he's a father, he was present. He said, that man, once he got saved, he could be put into a position of serving. Mm-hmm. You know, pretty quickly and could actually if he was in pursuit of God be put into a position of like a deaconship or something like that fairly quickly he said someone who did not have a father it would take about five times as long mm-hmm. just because they had to learn you had to reparent them almost before you could fully disciple them right I've heard that before reparent yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. which I think is, is just kind of a reality I, I've, I've learned that as a, as a now I don't come from a broken home I was blessed in that, but I've I've realized much more as a pastor that I need to be uh, a father. To I need a, I need to be a father, a, a big brother, an uncle. I need to be more familial. I need to be, need to be intentionally familiar with a lot more people. Than I realize yeah. at whatever level they receive me at. Mm-hmm. You know, I recognize there's people that they could be older than me that I could mentor and, 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 and provide fathering leadership for. Yeah. They won't receive me in that way because I'm younger than them. Sure. N- not all, but mm-hmm. that's okay. Just I recognize I have to be intentionally familial with them. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the Celts, the Celtic Christians, um, they, they grew in isolation to, to Rome. Rome had an idea that, that, that I said the Romanized church was we want you to agree intellectually with us, mm-hmm. and then you'll believe and belong. The the Celts took to the mindset of, we want to capture your heart, and then we'll disciple your mind. Right. And so we live in just such a highly emotive world, for better or worse. I think we have to kind of take that position now. We have to, you're, you're not going to disciple a mind that... That with how I say this, you're gonna have a very hard time discipling someone's mind or discipling period when you haven't really captured their heart, and that's the essence of what Jesus was saying. To the Jews, the, the, the saying of "I'll make you fishers of men" was not an uncommon saying. Yeah, that was typical rabbi. That was typical rabbinical language. What it meant was, I'm gonna teach you how to capture the hearts of men, just as one would capture the heart, capture a fish from the sea. Mm-hmm. And that's what we gotta do. We we can get to where we just want you know people to know the A B C's and D's, the formalities. This is what you need to think, believe, and all that. Mm-hmm. You can't do that without their heart being captured as well. And that's not just their heart. There's people that love Jesus. They don't trust you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's the thing we have to realize. Is, yeah. Is you have to build that rapport. Mm-hmm. You know. You have and to build trust with them. It's true. Last uh, last thing, we're gonna okay. wrap it up so you can go home. To your seventeen kids. My wife has worship practice here in a minute. So oh, I she does. Bolt, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I um, really do have to make it quick. <laughs> so, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners about, like experiences or insights that you feel that would bring them closer to to the Lord? Yeah, I got a book on evangelism coming out. Really? Yeah. That's incredible. I haven't settled the title on it yet, but um, wow. it's, it's a survey of God's restorative work okay. in humanity yeah. and amongst the nations. So the first half is pretty academical, it's historical, mm-hmm. it's biblical, and then the last half is action-oriented, testimony, 
Um, so I want them to get an, a, a, an idea, a concrete idea of what God has done in the invisible realm, mm-hmm. its impact on the visible, and what that means for us as we go and, and, and try to seek and save the lost. Yeah. What the gospel is in context mm-hmm. and their time. Yeah. Um, and are in the, in the, the time of, the, of, of scriptures. How's, how's that work? Um, how is that, how's that compared to what is commonly preached today? Mm-hmm. And then practical testimony and how to and how tos and so it's a lot of a lot of mind work heart work and then let's get to work yeah so yeah that'll help you yeah <laughs> I love it so you haven't said it on a title but it's coming out soon yeah the title's yeah. hard for me I don't know how to I'm how to bad say with it. titles too it's so I get it's it. ter- I had a, a friend of mine from Australia he I posted about the that I'd finished the first draft about a month ago and I said I don't have a title yet and he said I took I took all of you your chapters and what you said and put it in the chat GPT and here's some titles it came up with. It was actually pretty good. So there you go. Hey, well, praise we'll, God. We'll be looking for that. Uh, the next time you, when it, when it comes out, you'll have to come back on and then you can do a shameless plug. Yeah. It'd be and an we'll, honor. Well, that was my shameless plug. Greg said, yeah. make sure you plug your book yeah, well, there you on go. there. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, no, seriously, in all seriousness, um, I believe evangelism, uh, is not, uh, let me say this. The how-tos of evangelism are radically simple. Mm-hmm. It's 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 helping someone to posture their heart in a way towards God and towards others and towards themselves. Uh, that's the difficult part. Mm-hmm. And so again, it's it's so we we want to you know push the how-tos on a person without you know delving into the the function of the soul, right? And and their spirit and mind, you know. So it's more of a like, hey, let's build you up here and. As we do this, evangelism will be a natural flow. And yeah. then when that desire hits, that natural desire to do what every Christian is designed to do hits, here's some very practical how-tos and instructions and what to be aware of on how to do it personally in different contexts and also how to build evangelism teams as a church. Right. Well, tell everybody where they can find you on social media so they can keep up with you. Ned Merriman, N-E-D, M-A-R-A-M-A-N on Facebook. On Facebook. That's it. That's I'm, it. Not, I'm not hip like Instagram. <laughs> you know, I'm getting my middle ages, so. I'm 39. I, I do have an Instagram, but I'm not on there a whole lot. But, uh, yeah, that's the easiest way to do it. I got you. Well, dude, I love you. Thank you for coming out and doing this with me. It's been and, fun uh, and been an honor. We're going to have you back very soon. All right, cool. All right, we love you, man. Love you. Appreciate you. you.